This morning we're continuing the series that we started last week called Parallel. This idea that the Old and the New Testament, even though they were written many, many years apart, they have the same message, that it's about the same God and his same incredible love for us. I don't know if anybody else has noticed this, but through the last few months, there's just kind of been an atmosphere of constant tension in the world. And my hope today is to remind you that regardless of what you see, regardless of what you experience, regardless of what you feel and hear, that God still reigns. That despite the mask that you have to wear, despite COVID, despite the tension, despite what the media tells us, that God is still on the throne. That God is never unprepared and that he is greater than what we face. Despite the trials, we serve the one who has overcome the world. And guess what? He is still victorious. He still loves you, and he did not die to abandon you. He died so that you would have hope in this life and in the next. And you'd say, Pastor Will, that's great. How do you know this? I know this because that's what his word tells us. It's what it tells us in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Deuteronomy 24 says this, For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. 1 John 4, 4, But you belong to God, my dear children, You've already won a victory because he who lives in you is greater than he who lives in the world. He that is in you is greater than he who is in the world, and so you already have victory. We are victorious not because of our ability, but we are victorious because our God is victorious. But what, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? What has he given us victory over? If you're following along with notes this morning, you can get ready to fill in some blanks. We're going to go through these pretty quick. God gives us victory over our anxious thoughts. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what could be. Fear of what might not be. Will we have school? Will I lose my job? Will I get COVID-19? Will any of my loved ones pass away? Is the government trying to take over? Whatever dark roads our minds, our anxious thoughts take us on, whether true or not, Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, do not be anxious about anything but with everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what will happen? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. He also gives us victory over our current battle. Whatever it is that you're struggling with right now, whatever sin, whatever sickness, whatever trial, whatever temptation, whatever frustration, whatever obstacles you face, whatever valley you feel you're walking through right now, whatever it is that's weighing down on your hearts, I read again Deuteronomy 24, for the Lord your God is the one that goes with you in your struggle, with you in your fight against all of your enemies, against all of your current battles to give you victory. It's also victory over our past, the sum of all our mistakes, our failures, our mess-ups, our bad decisions, the things that you can't seem to forgive yourself of. Isaiah 62, 1 and 2, I just want to read the highlighted part. You will no longer be bound to who you used to be, for I will give you a new name straight from the mouth of God, no longer bound to your past. He also gives us victory over the world and its rulers, the pull of the world, our desires and vices, all the enemies that are working against us, Satan and his band of demons, and the desire for us to be God ourselves. Ephesians 6, 12 and 13 says, For our struggle is often not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, 
against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. You may be able to have victory through what God has given you. And last but not least, God has given us victory over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. Oh, death, where, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? I don't see it. Because the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So death becomes something that, that we no longer should fear, but something that we welcome now in eternity because death is where our Savior waits for us. It's where he finds us. Death is where God gives us new life. You say, Pastor, man, that sounds real great, but uh, I, don't, I don't feel too victorious. How do, we, how do we experience this victory that you talk about? I'm glad you asked. I think there's three things that we can do. First and foremost, we have got to learn to stop fighting for our victory and to fight from his victory. Instead of fighting for your victory, fight from his victory. Now, I'm assuming that uh, most of you that are in here today have heard the name Michael Jordan before. Michael Jordan is arguably the greatest basketball player of all time. But I'm guessing that this morning that you don't know a man in which I know is the Haitian sensation. My brothers grew up playing basketball in high school and I tried to be at every game that I could be at. And they had a guy on their team that was from Haiti who we called the Haitian sensation. And his basketball playing skills were nothing but not sensational at all. In fact, he did something that I didn't think was possible. He dunked on the wrong goal. <laughs> he scored points for the wrong team. So we would be willing to say that Michael Jordan is just a tiny bit better than the Haitian sensation, but both of these men have something in common. Both of these men couldn't win on their own. I don't know if you watched the uh, Last Dance, the, the documentary on Jordan. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. But one of the pieces that I enjoyed was his early career and, and watching him play against a Celtics team that had five Hall of Famers. And Jordan in the playoff scores a record-breaking 60-something points against this team, and they still lost. And one of the things that I appreciated about the documentary was Jordan coming out and saying, I don't think I would have won any championships without Scottie Pippen, without the team around me. So whether you're Michael Jordan or you're the Haitian sensation, you cannot win on your own. And the same is true of life. You know, we give Kevin Durant a hard time for joining a 72-win team, but that's exactly what God wants us to do spiritually. He says, why don't you join my team, a team that has already won the victory? It's your choice. You can keep trying on your own, or you can join my team. If you want to experience victory that is already happening, sometimes we've got to let go of our own agenda for God's, our own way of doing things and trusting in God's plan. Genesis 16.2 says this, and Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. So go into my servant, and it may be that I shall obtain a child by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Can I just say that it is never good when we human beings take it upon ourselves to fulfill the promises of God by our own plan. When we do this, it removes our faith in God and it places our faith solely on ourselves. And this is not a good thing because we have the aptitude to screw up our lives. It's not a good thing because we can only see what we see, but we serve a God who sees the big picture. 
And can we just get honest just for a second? God does not need our help fulfilling his promises. But Sarai and Abram, they, they perverted the promise of God with Ishmael, son of Hagar. And his plan wasn't evil and he didn't mean any harm. But good intentions cannot rationalize sin. See, they were convinced that, that God wanted him to sleep with Hagar to bring about the promise of an heir. But Abram was trusting in his own promise to bring about God's promise. We do the same thing. Do we not at times get impatient with God and seek our own path? Do we not occasionally find ways to supposedly accomplish God's plan? I think it's important to know where God's leading us, but it's as equally important to be attentive and to listen to his plan on how to get there. You know, there's some times where I, I, I wake up and I, and I go into Malin's room and I say, guess what? Guess what we're going to do today? We're going to go to the zoo. And I don't expect Malin to, to make the plan for us. I don't expect her to pack a lunch. I don't expect her to drive us there. I just expect her to get ready. And I'm going to take care of the details. It's like life at the hospital. No, no doctor expects you to get there and, and perform the surgery on yourself. But guess what? Sometimes you got you to sit there and wait for the doctor. Can I get an amen on that one? Sometimes it's about being patient and waiting for God to move, trusting that he's going to fulfill the promises that he's made to you. And I get that you, you look at this story and you think to yourself, well, listen, Pastor Will, I'm not trying to have a child at 100 years old. I get that. But God seeks more than just to fulfill his promises to you. He seeks to change a world through the radical faith of his people. He seeks to bring a victory to you that is not of this world. And he does not need your help to bring it about, but he does want you to experience it. He wants you to be a part of it. I wonder if sometimes we, we don't feel victorious because sometimes we're fighting the wrong battle. We're fighting a battle that we don't even need to fight. And maybe sometimes we're expecting victory to look differently. Or we, ex we, we assume that success and victory are synonymous, and they're not. I want to read a quote to you by Jose Navajo. He says, We who serve God often confuse success and victory. We try to attain great achievements, and we forget that God loves us for who we are and not what we do. And by focusing on success, we confuse it with victory. God did not live obsessed with drawing crowds. There were only a handful of people gathered around the cross, and we do not highly esteem signs of success regarding it. Nevertheless, the cross was the greatest victory that anyone has ever achieved. Success is a term for the business world. Victory is a term used for combat. We are not involved in a business, but rather a war. And God loves his soldiers so much more than the results. And the reason for that is that the results are not responsible for the soldiers. We have to quit focusing on what we can do through our own power and remember and sit and be still and remember what God has already done. I put this in your outline, and please believe me, I know that it is overly cheesy, and I apologize for that, but it is so important to remember that the triumph belongs to God, that triumph begins with try, and it's important to give our effort, but we must remember that God is the umph. The triumph already belongs to God. And you can try to save yourself if you want to, or you can lean into a Savior that is already made away and every morning we've going to have to make that decision like who are you going to choose to live for who are you going to choose to fight for are you going to live for God or are you going to live for yourself are you going to fight for God or are you going to fight for yourself at the end of the day what will your legacy be when you pass away and you're gone from this world what will people remember you by Will they remember you as a hard worker? Will they remember you as successful? Or will they remember you as victorious? Will they remember you as being rich in money or being rich in love? Somebody they enjoyed to be around. Those are the kind of people God is asking us to be. To quit chasing after our own provision, our own plan, and to buy in to his plan. To love God, to love our neighbor. The next piece of this, I think, is that we've got 
to trust, to quit trusting how we feel and to start trusting in his word. Instead of trusting how you feel, trust in his word. Those of you that, that know me pretty well, you know that I love to take pictures. And I love to take pictures of wildlife. And so I love to go to the zoo because at the zoo, the animals can't run away from you. Uh, and, it, and it makes it just a, just a little bit easier, a little bit nicer. But one of the biggest problems with taking pictures at the zoo is that there's quite a few animals that are in, uh, they don't call them cages because that's rude. Uh, they call them enclosures, okay? And so sometimes it's difficult to get a good photograph through a fence, right? And so sometimes you end up with a picture like this. And you're like, man, that would have been a cool picture other than the fact that you can see fence, the lines across his face. And so there's, there's a little trick with photography that I've learned as, as I've done more is that if you have some space between the fence and the animal and you get close enough to the fence, you can focus on the animal and you can focus so much on the animal that the fence becomes so out of focus that you can't see it anymore and you can get an actual picture where the fence isn't in the way, right? The same is true of our lives. You can focus completely on how you feel. You can focus on the world around you, or you can focus on the Word of God. You can focus on the Word of God so much that your feelings still exist. Listen, the fence is still there, and praise God the fence is still there. Because I wouldn't be here today. I would have been lunch, right? Right? The fence is still there, but you don't see it. Your feelings are still there, but if you trust in the Word of God, if you let the Word of God soak over your life, it changes everything. So you've got to decide today which, which one are you going to choose to focus on. You're going to have to decide whether or not you want your life to be defined by your feelings or to be defined by your faith. Romans 8, 31-39 says this, What should... What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Should it be tribulation? What about distress? What about persecution? What about famine? What about nakedness? What about danger? Maybe the sword. No. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors because of him who loves us. And then Paul goes on and says, For I am sure, for I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers nor things present or to come, nor powers nor height nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate me from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know if your experience has been any different than mine, but tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, the sword, uh, none of those things make you feel good, right? None of them do, but, but what Paul is saying here is he says it's okay because none of those things have the power to separate me from the love of God. And I'm going to refuse to give them power over me because I believe deep in my soul that my God is greater. He says here, I am sure. So my question for you today is, are you sure? And listen, just because you don't feel like a conqueror doesn't mean that you're not one. Listen, I'm a youth pastor. Most of my life, I don't feel like an adult. I still feel like I'm 18 years old. We went on this trip to Broken Bow, and I got out of the car to get groceries, and I'm thinking to myself, why are they put me in charge? I'm just a kid, right? And anybody in the youth group, especially Danny right here, will tell you that there are times that I don't act like an adult, right? But it doesn't mean that I'm not one. So my question for you is what, what, what feeling, what lie are you going to let convince you that you've been separated from God's love? You know, what feeling, what, what mask requirement, what virus, what failure, what mistake, what bad choice, what stress in your life are you allowing to blind you from he who holds tomorrow? 
And what would happen if God's people humbled themselves and prayed and sought his face and turned from their wicked ways? What would happen if we spent more time in our Bibles than we did on social media? More time in our Bibles than we did watching the news? What if we began to put his word before our feelings? To overcome your feelings, you need the overflowing fundamental truth of God. We need the repetition of it bathed over our hearts and minds daily. So that regardless of how we feel, regardless of what happens in the world, we can claim when we go to bed at night, it is well with my soul. Because none of those things can separate me from God. Living every day knowing how much he loves you, how much he wants you, and that he died for you because he believes in you. Instead of trusting how you feel, trust his word. A word that proclaims victory over our anxiety, victory over the battle that we face, victory over our past, victory over our enemies, victory over death. Let me give you one more. Instead of carrying your chains, carry his grace. Instead of carrying your chains, carry his grace. Now the story that I'm about to tell you is a little embarrassing for me. So please please try not to laugh too hard. Corbin knows what's about to happen. You ready for this? So I'm in college. I'm a freshman. I'm sleeping in my dorm. I'm having a great night's rest. All of a sudden, I start having this dream, right? And in this dream, I'm in my dorm room, and I've gotten up, and I've made my way to the bathroom, and I'm using the bathroom. And it's happening in real life. And it's a dream. And I'm still in my bed. And I'm 19 years old, and I've peed the bed. 19 years old, people. I don't know why, but I was furious. Like, I don't know where, like, people normally idle. They idle high, and then you get angry, and you see their anger. I was 10 steps above, right? So I grabbed, I'm so mad. I grabbed the bedding. I grabbed the mattress because it was like a two-inch thing that wasn't comfortable anyways. I grabbed it all. I took it outside, went out the door. I'm on the second story. I'm on the balcony. I throw everything off of the balcony, screaming, you're 19 years old. I'm, I'm livid. And as that's happening, President Fossard, I was walking around the corner with a group of students that are touring the campus for the first time. And I can't speak to whether or not any of them decided to come to Mackey or not. But I'm not exactly sure that was the greatest example of being a good student, right? But I, I think back to that time, and, and it, it's so crazy to me why I was so burdened by something so small, so burdened because I didn't feel like I measured up, because I felt like it's ridiculous that a 19-year-old would pee the bed. And so I'm, I'm mad at myself. Have you ever been that mad at yourself before? Have maybe you just been super stressed out? Maybe you've been worried about the future Maybe you have kids and you're worried about them or maybe your job. Maybe there's debt that's weighing on you. Maybe grief. Maybe some unmet potential inside of you. Maybe a disability. Maybe a broken relationship. Maybe the current storms that you face. All these things that that just weigh on us. And and sometimes we let the, the, the weight of our mistakes and the weight of everything that's happening just bind us like chains. So much so that it affects the way that we treat others. It affects the way that we view ourselves. This is what Ephesians says, 2, 4 through 5. But God, with the unfathomable richness of his love and mercy focused on us, united us with the anointed one 
and infused our lifeless souls with life. And even though we were buried under mountains of sin, he has saved us with what? With his grace. I love this because even though you might be buried under a mountain of sin, even though you might be buried under a mountain of your own baggage, under your own foolishness, it doesn't matter because he has saved you with grace. Not because you deserved it, not because you earned it, not because you wanted it, because he loved you and he gave it freely. Scripture says that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, that you can move mountains. And I'm starting to realize that maybe he wasn't talking about moving literal mountains, but maybe he was talking about moving those mountains of burden that have come over us, that we carry with us every day. Burden of our sin, burden of our past, burden of not becoming who we think we should be. He says that through faith, And through grace, God will lift those mountains from your back. He will take those burdens away. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says this. It says, come to me, all who labor, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take upon my yoke. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus here is telling us, he's saying, come to me and I will give you rest. All of you that are tired, all of you that are broken, all of you that are overwhelmed, all of you that are hurting, all of you that are oppressed, all of you that are lonely, all of you that are struggling, come to me and you will find rest. Rest for what? Rest for your soul. I don't know about you, but sometimes the weight of the world keeps me up at night. Sometimes the weight of my own world keeps me up at night. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you've you've just become so overwhelmed with the state of your life or the world that you just seize up? Does the yoke just ever seem like it gets too hard to push? It makes you want to give up. And Jesus says, listen, (laughs) my yoke is light. My burden is easy. Why don't you come on over? Be a part of my life. And he's saying this, your life's not going to get easy, but you're going to have me on the other side of the yoke. Jesus suggests that we leave our own to join him, that under his yoke we might allow him to take the lead. Instead of wondering where to go or just pushing blindly ahead, we follow, we listen, we learn. He says the burden is, is light because Jesus is the strength in our weakness. Because when we lack the ability to carry our own weight, he carries it for us. When the weight of the world seeks to crush you, remember that Jesus, the one who can bear the weight of the world, is on the other side. When the burden of your past seems to be too much for you to bear, know that Jesus is attached to you, lifting you up with his grace, which means that you no longer have to be bound by those chains. To be reminded that you are not defined by what you've done or who you've been. You're not even defined by what you think you deserve. You're defined by a God full of grace who gives you life and breath every morning because he loves you, because he sees that you're valuable, because he still believes in you. There's no need to be held back by your past poor decisions. Because of Jesus, every new day is a chance to be different, a chance to be better, a chance to let go of your past so that you can grab hold of a different future. Jesus died so that you could find hope in your current struggle because of his incredible grace. So just for a moment, think about all those chains. Think about all those things that hold you down. Think about all those things that bring you shame, all those feelings of worthlessness. And today, on the altars of God, choose to let it go. Because even though those feelings are real, that's exactly what they are. They're worthless. Today, choose to forgive you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. God says that if you believe in me, if you repent of your sins, then you are a new creation. You're not bound to repeat your past. 
You're not bound to who you used to be. You're no longer bound to your sin. And you're no longer bound to death. You are changed by grace. You are changed, not as a requirement of grace, but because of a product of grace. It is grace that has saved us. It is grace that has changed us. I don't pretend to know where you are today. I don't pretend to know what you face. I don't pretend to know what struggles you'll face today or in the week ahead. But I do know that whatever we face, there is a God in whom we cannot be separated from. And this God loves you more than you could ever fathom or understand. And so I want you to know, and if this is the only thing you hear today, know that when you walk outside these doors and you face this world, you do not have to face it alone. And you're probably going to make some more mistakes. But guess what? God says, I got more grace. That doesn't mean that we go out and we live however we want to, relying on grace. But it means that we have an advocate that's in our corner that is seeking to walk by our side to help us be the people of God, the people he's called us to be. Quit fighting for your own victory. God's already won a victory, right? Quit focusing on your feelings. Pay attention to God's word. Focus there. Let go of your chains and be soaked in God's grace. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your truth. What a blessing to be in this house, mask or not. What a blessing to be able to gather with people that believe. What a blessing to be reminded in your scripture over and over and over again of your incredible love for us. And I, I, I pray today that, that we'd leave this place changed. Changed because of your grace. That maybe we'd even begin to see ourselves like you see us. To see ourselves a little bit differently because I know that there's a lot of times that we look into the mirror and all we see is what we're not help us to see what you see help us to see the beauty that you created in us the beauty that you made the, the care the, the the wonder that you you use to make and create our soul help us to cling to you as we face a world of uncertainty, help us to know that one thing is for sure. And regardless of what happens to us in this life, it is you we find in the next. We love you. We praise you. In your holy name, amen.